right, just gonna kick it off here. If people pop in late, what have you. Um, so just so everyone knows, I, I've got to actually, unfortunately, leave immediately right after this, so we won't have too much time for questions. But you know, drop me a card or whatever, we'll do it. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is, you know, my background is is the uber anti-momentum person. So the fact that I'm sitting here talking about momentum at a CMT conference is borderline insane. If you asked me that 10, 15 years ago, um, just because I've, I've always been. I kind of grew up on Ben Graham, intelligent investor, Warren Buffett, you know, fundamental stock picking. And in that religion, if you even mention technicals or momentum, they, you know, it's literally you're going to get hung. Um, so it took me a long time to finally kind of join the team here. Um, so so this, this is a presentation that is kind of reflective of my long journey to finally kind of think CMT is not a bunch of lunatic uh, people. It's probably a legit idea. So what we're going to talk about today is momentum, but a very particular vein, relative strength momentum or cross-sectional momentum. I'll, I'll kind of explain exactly what I mean by that so, so we can have a conversation that is fruitful. And then we're going to talk about three core questions that we get all the time where I think the answers might be counterintuitive and, and perhaps surprising. And the first question is, okay, momentum's great, but does this get eaten alive in transaction costs? That would mean momentum's a waste of time. The other one is, okay, great, it doesn't get destroyed in transaction costs, but if everyone's trading it, the thing's too crowded, so that's also a bad situation. And then the third one is, okay, you can trade it profitably after costs, there's too many people that know about it and do it, how can it be possible that open secrets, where everyone knows about momentum, can continue to work out of sample, right? And I'll, I'll give you at least a framework for understanding why that may be possible, even though it's not intuitive. So first thing we'll cover is what is momentum? And again, momentum actually is a lot of things to a lot of different people. There's momentum, there's time series, there's trend following, there's cross-sectional, there's all these ideas, and they all can be called momentum. What I'm talking about here, and I'll, I'll keep switching between uh, charts here to give everyone some love. Um, this is what I'm talking about, relative strength momentum. On the x-axis here, we have time. On the y-axis, we have cumulative return. So the general idea behind the momentum that I'm going to be discussing, which in the financial literature is called cross-sectional momentum, is let's say we have a two stock universe, stock A and stock B, at a point in time, say 12 months, like over 12 months, we're gonna compare the cumulative returns of A to B. And if whatever one is, has relative strength, i.e. the winner, is one that's gonna presumably keep on winning, this is the momentum stock, this would be the non-momentum stock, right? So this core basic idea in the strategy that I'm going to be talking about is this. We want to own A, we don't want to own B because we believe there's a continuation in winners and a continuation in losers, but to the wrong you know, direction. Um, the other thing to clarify is right here I have two stock charts that are basically positive and I said that A is great. We could have a situation where stock A is down 10% and stock B is down 50%. In a cross-sectional momentum strategy, stock A would still be cool, right? So even though they're both negative trend, from a relative strength standpoint, A is still preferable to B, and we would still buy A. Just to make sure we differentiate relative strength momentum from absolute momentum or trend following. I right? just want to be very clear exactly what we're talking about here when I say momentum. And the reason we're focusing on this form of momentum is this is the form of momentum that has, is cat all the hubbub in academic literature. So, and this is what helps generate what they call the momentum factor in the you know Fama French kind of regression models. And these two gentlemen here, uh, Eugene Fama and Ken French, who are you know basically huge believers in the uh, Fisher Market hypothesis, even they have finally admitted that 
this momentum idea, specifically the one I'm talking about here, cross-sectional momentum, is basically the premier king of anomalies. We cannot explain it with rational risk models. Like with value, you can argue, well, value works and earns a premium because you gotta buy all this trash or firms that are heavily exposed to like fundamental macro risk. You know, so you can kind of, you know, tangle with that and, and justify why it earns a, a premium in an efficient market sense. But momentum is something where even after torturing theory and trying your best, it's really, really hard to explain momentum and its excess premiums in a purely risk-based framework, which is why they say this is crazy and we can't explain it, basically. So when these people admit that the evidence is very clear, I, I think the, there is no argument that momentum doesn't work at least in a research sense. That doesn't mean we, not, we may not be able to do it in an implementation sense, which we'll talk about next, but the, the facts are clear, no one really disagrees who's you know, in the business of research. One thing a lot of people debate, though, is transaction costs. And the argument is, okay, fine, you found this momentum thing, and it earns all these huge returns, but it requires a ton of trading and turnover, so after frictional costs, it's a waste of our time, right? So we're going to talk about that debate. I'll move over here. So to orient you to this chart, before I even tell you what's in it, this x-axis here the, it has three columns. The academic column represents basically a, a summary of what their conclusion is for the capacity of momentum strategies. This column right here is, is what AQR believes the capacity of momentum strategies are. And this column right here is what BlackRock believes the capacity of momentum strategies are. And the y-axis here is the, is the capacity in billions. So what is the summary on how all this research works? Well, what the academics will do, and they say it's five, around $5 billion, whereas the practitioners, who I'll mention here, are heavily conflicted, have a magnitude difference in, in the capacity, is what academics will do is they'll use what they call TAC data, and, and they'll implement like a momentum strategy under the assumption that you're probably gonna hit the midpoint, right? Or it's, it's not like how an institutional investor would actually trade a strategy, where it's not, you're not getting the quoted spread, a lot of times you get effective spreads, which are a lot better and tighter than what's in the TAC data, right? So executions from people that think about you know, trend execution are a lot of times a lot better than what like the raw data is going to say. So if you use academic data source of TAC, no matter how you cut it, they all get around $5 billion would be the capacity on momentum before you just eat it away in impact costs and friction costs. That kind of stinks, right? Whereas then you go over to the practitioners, AQR and BlackRock, where they have bajillion dollars of trading execution history where they can actually say, hey, here, here's what I wanted to go to the market at. Here's what, when I put in my bids, here was the market price. And then after executed, here was the final price. And then kind of get estimates of impact, build these models to determine, you know, better, more accurate, views of what are the real frictional costs of executing, right? And so they have this amazing data that's all proprietary, that's live transaction cost data. And they say, no academics, you're wrong, your data sucks, ours is a lot better because it's real, and we identify that we get a magnitude more capacity. So what you'll see here is that certainly the case can be made that momentum is capacity constrained, but it's the magnitude varies dramatically, depending on who you ask. The problem is, with the professionals over here, it's, it'd be like a tobacco company, you know, writing research about how smoking cigarettes cures cancer, right? It's just, at some level, they may have great data, but they obviously have a conflict here. Just like the practitioners, AQR and BlackRock, clearly have a conflict because they want to tell you you can own and do momentum cost, you know, not cost prohibitively because they sell these things, right? So there is a huge conflict, whereas presumably the academics don't have a conflict, let's just pretend. Um, but in the end, it really comes down to the data, right? Because it is the case that 
the pros have better data. So a really kind of interesting trap that AQR did in their study, they're like, okay, we get it. We're conflicted. We're, we're going to always have this forever debates on the TAC data is better or our data is better, but you don't believe our data because we're conflicted. Here's what we're going to do. We know a few data points. We know the cost of implementing the SP500, because people have been doing that for years, and Vanguard's prospectus tells us it's basically around 10 basis points, right? iShares prospectus says it's around 6 to 7 basis points, right? So let's just say for conservative math it's around 5 to 10 bits. Known data point of how much it costs to implement this brain dead index right here. Right? So NQR team says, okay, fine. Let's do a benchmarking. We're going to estimate the cost to execute SP500 using the academic technique with their data, and we're going to estimate the cost of executing SP500 using our technique and our data. And what they show is that they see, hey, if we use the, the approach that we're doing using our data, we estimate that the cost of training SP500 is around six bips almost perfectly in line with reality. Whereas they say, if we do the academic version with their data and their approach, it costs over 60 basis points to trade the SP500. That's not true, right? So it's kind of a, a, like they kind of caught them where they said, hey, the reason there's a magnitude difference here is because your approach stinks and ours is better, right? So bottom line is there's, I think, even though they're conflicted, that this is a pretty compelling case <clears throat> that the practitioner data and their approaches in the BlackRock paper and AQR paper are more believable. Which means that momentum has a lot more capacity, maybe in what academic research says, but it's clearly constrained, right? It's not like you could do a trillion dollars in this. Um, the other reality, and I'll, I'll move over here, is just the cold hard facts that the, the, the returns generated from momentum are built with portfolios that will be capacity constrained. So let me orient you to this chart. What this is, is this is compound growth rates over the last 40 or 50 years, where it's the same exact momentum strategy. You sort stocks relative strength on 212 momentum. Just think of those last 12 month returns, you have 1,000 securities, if you want to own the top 10%, you'd own the top 100 based on who's got the highest past 12 month return, right? But that core signal can be varied on portfolio construction. We could buy the top 500 securities based on momentum, or we could buy the top 50 on momentum, right? Like, so we could go low concentrated momentum, high concentrated momentum. The other way we can vary this portfolio is how fast we turn it over. So we could, on January 1, do the, do the momentum sort, and then wait till next January, do the momentum sort, and rebound some portfolio that way. Or we could go high frequency, up here where it says one, and do it every single month, right? And what you notice is there's pretty much a, a direct relationship between returns and how concentrated and how high intense the turnover is with momentum, i.e., it's mechanically capacity constrained because fewer securities means less capacity. It's a lot easier to put $100 in divvy around 500 stocks as opposed to 50 because you got to put too much in each one. And then obviously turnover is a capacity constraint because I got to trade a lot more doing a monthly rebounds versus an annual rebounds, right? And so the, the cold hard facts is if you don't do momentum in a way that has capacity constraints, you don't earn the returns. Like this area down here, which is diluted, low frequency momentum, basically earns the market, plus or minus a little bit, right? So this is the fact. Um, so, and the bottom line is momentum is certainly constrained. Great. We know it's constrained. Now let's ask the question, is it too crowded? Because this is another concern, um, because there's so, especially with ETFs out there, and everyone's doing factors, and everyone's got momentum, this, that, and other thing. You know, everyone's, this is like a picture from a train in India. Everyone's on the momentum.
train right now. So they're going to ruin it, and that capacity constraint that we mentioned is going to be blown out of the water. Well, let's investigate this hypothesis. And there's actually a paper. So David Blitz has a paper where they say, let's actually look at what has the ETF industry been doing on the momentum factor. And their kind of conclusion is, all that the ETF industry has done on in aggregate, where it kind of makes sense, is bought a lot of beta and not a lot of factor in aggregate. So for every, every buyer, there's always a seller. And on net, you don't see dramatic tilts from ETF allocations and funds it, as if they're like exploiting value to maximum extent. So it seems to be on aggregate, it's just sloshing money around, but on net, it's just beta, which I think would probably make sense to most people. Um, so here in particular is the exposure of a swath, basically large swaths of ETS on the momentum factor in particular. So let me orient you to this chart. The X axis here is the momentum beta. So if you run a factor regression of the returns on your ETF against you know, momentum factor and all a bunch of other control factors, this is the beta or the relationship between the returns on that particular fund and the momentum factor. Zero means you have no exposure. Obviously, way over here, negative one means you're an anti-momentum trader. And then if you're way out here in this extreme, that means you're a positive momentum factor loader, right? And what you'll see is that in aggregate, oh, sorry, in the, the y-axis is assets under management. So if you really believed in the hypothesis of overcrowding, what, and you were really wanting to be concerned about it, you'd see a huge mass over here where massive assets under management, massive global macro kind of momentum exposure, that would be scary, because that would be saying, hey, pretty much everyone with a ton of money is in the momentum trade, but that's not what you see at all. You basically see on aggregate a lot of noise, and it all maps out to around zero. Because for every you know, extreme momentum trader, there's an extreme anti-momentum trader. So they're kind of counteracting each other. Another very interesting component is when they, when, they, when they actually look at who has the highest momentum factors, the top 10 and the bottom 10, you don't even see a single momentum factor fund in there. Because if you think about it, the momentum factor is a trade that a lot of people aren't systematically exploiting. They're just accidentally stumbling into, either positively or negatively. And most of these are huge sloths of money in sector funds. And this is pretty similar with what we've already known for a long time. Because if you guys ever read the uh, Mark Harhart's uh, 97 paper, he's the one that kind of put momentum factor on the map. What he talks about is when, when you look at the cross-section of mutual fund performance, you, you do see that winners keep on winning. There's a little persistence until you, you control for momentum. Because a lot of mutual fund managers or stock pickers or sector people or whatever, they accidentally get lucky and they're in the momentum trade and that's why they have good performance. But it's not like they're systematically momentum traders. So after the fact, the winners don't keep on winning, especially when you control for momentum, because they weren't really doing momentum. They accidentally got lucky they were doing momentum but then the next quarter, the next year, they move on to the other stocks they like, but they don't happen to be momentum, and they go back to being losers, right? So same thing here. Tons of money sloshing around, indirectly uh, providing supply and demand on momentum factor, but this, this sort of capital dwarfs the amount of capital that's dedicated to systematically and disciplinedly exploiting momentum, at least right now. The other thing to consider in orange of this chart is asking the question is, even if you are a momentum factor fund, are you actually even trading momentum factor? And you would think intuitively, well, yeah, if you're going to call your fund a momentum factor fund, you should trade momentum factor. That would be the idea. And so what this chart does is I'll orient you here. The x-axis is basically your exposure to the momentum uh, tw uh, last 12 month momentum at a holdings base level. I use these, these broad brush circles. Really, this would be a lot of holdings. Um, and then on the y axis, this is market cap exposure. So down here, if you had, a, if you had exposure right here, it means you're on the zero percentile market cap. So this would be like 
10 million dollar companies. A dot up here would be Amazon, you know, like five or 600 billion or whatever it is. So if you look off here to the right, this swath, this blue or color blind, I think that's blue, um, this swath over here that's in the red box, this is the academic momentum portfolio where if you just bought the top decile of the, the best momentum names on the last 12 month return, that's what it would actually look like in real time. And it makes sense. It's super concentrated in the 10 percentile momentum names. And it turns out that right now, it's kind of broadly distributed across market caps, right? There's a bunch in the small, mid, and large. So there's no real relationship right now with momentum and market cap. But clearly, with the academic by construction momentum portfolio, it has a perfect relationship with momentum because that's what it's doing. And then what we do is we say, okay, let's plot NTUM, which is iShares product, Fidelity Momentum Factor, JP Morgan Momentum Factor, SPY. And what you'll notice here <coughs> is that if they were trading the momentum factor that's buried in the long short thing, and it's talked about everywhere in academic papers, it should have a strong relationship to this, because that is the, the decile portfolio. What you notice is the relationship on these momentum funds is much stronger with market cap. So these are really mega cap factor beta funds with a very small exposure to actual momentum as is traditionally drawn up and talked about in academic research. Now they may be saying, hey, we do our own momentum that's better than what the academics have done, but if you're a believer in the momentum factor, and you're a believer in all the data and you've read all the papers, well, that is about this kind of momentum, which they're not really doing. So it's unclear to me that even if there's a lot of things that are called momentum in the title, we still want to fact check them and are they actually doing the momentum strategy? It doesn't seem to be the case. So all of that is to say that, to summarize, that momentum is a super interesting trade. It's definitely capital constrained and it doesn't look like the marketplace is fully exploited would be my guess. Could that change in the future? Sure. So let's ask about that. Everyone here obviously knows about momentum because you're in a freaking CMT program, right? So, and this is something that uh, John Bolger was talking about. This is not a new idea. This has been around for a hundred years and I'm sure if you read about trading markets, you know, a thousand years ago, they probably would talk about momentum because it's just it just is what it is, right? And one of the arguments is that well, we've got too many guys like Tucker with all these machine learning, data mining, optimization brainiacs. There's just too many people, too many computers, too many quants. Momentum is dead because it's so simple and stupid, and everyone knows about it. And that's a fine hypothesis until you start step back and try to understand economics, right? So why do these damn strategies work in the first place? And it, this should be a fundamental question that everyone should ask. And before you do any strategy, you gotta try to understand out of sample, why am I getting paid, basically? Because you're in a market. It's not like you're in a vacuum. When you buy, someone's selling, and when you sell, someone's buying. So this, this whole game is this we're not in this to like you know kumbaya like you know, you're trying to make money when you're investing let's just be honest about it right um but this question is actually incredibly complex and i don't think anyone has the answer yet because you got fama over here where he wins the nobel prize for saying that hey markets are efficient prices always reflect fundamentals if you think you're getting any sort of free lunch you're crazy and not only that the it, 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 the prices always reflect the data perfectly, right? Which is, that's his hypothesis. Then you got Schiller, who also won the Nobel Prize at the same time. He says, you're insane because people are insane, so markets are not efficient. So now you got two Nobel Prize winners with diametrically opposed views on this fundamental question of, Try to understand why does anything work in the first place? What is the relationship between risk and return? So this is a scary situation 
You know, and they go back and forth. I'm just summarizing their debates. Bob was like, well, yeah, but why don't we find that all these mutual fund managers beat the market all the time? He's like, well, because people are insane. <laughs> you know, so they're not getting anywhere. But what's interesting is if you take the ideas of both of them, I think you actually have the solution, potentially. This is my best work in theory here. And the math, this quant equation is super complex here, basically says that the reason you earn returns and things work is because it's part Fama and part Schiller. Why is it part Fama? Well, if there's higher risk in something fundamentally, and you're in a dynamic equilibrium where you're, when you're buying, someone's selling, higher risk should mean higher return because people don't like risk. They don't like losing their money, right? So it makes sense that if something has a lot more volatility that's associated with some sort of systematic problem or macro-wide uh, economic deal, you should get more return. And this is the fun argument. More risk, more return, and it's going to be associated with risk in equilibrium. That makes sense. Then there's the mispricing argument, which is that, well, people are insane, which is true. I don't think there's any debate on that anymore. Um, but then the more complex question is people are insane. They can make prices get mispriced. But there's also a lot of really smart people that like to make money. So to the extent that mispricing is easy and costs us to exploit, it won't exist at the margin because in the old Friedman concept, if a, you know, if a stock is undervalued, the, the smart people lever up and they get it right at the margin where it's at the fundamental value and you know, markets are efficient. And, but that assumes that arbitraging is easy, costless, and not a problem. The reality is even if people know about mispricing, they don't necessarily say, oh, that's a free lunch. They're like, that sucks. Like, let, let, I'm not, this is controversial, but let's just pretend you thought Tesla was overvalued, right? A lot of people do. I'm not saying it is, because I know there's like Bitcoin people I get hating all the time, but like, let's just say the value guy like me by nature, Tesla seems insanely overvalued to me, right? But I wouldn't short that in any planet that I've ever been on any time. Because I know that shorting something like that is like playing with a grenade, man. It's, it's going to blow up in your face. You can be right, but you will always be wrong. right? So there is mispricing out there where a lot of people know about it, and they're probably right, but good luck trying to exploit it. So that's mispricing that's sustainable because it's costly to exploit. And this can lead to a premium, potentially, over the long haul. The bottom line is the reason stuff works is there's a no pain, no gain mantra. And that pain can come in the form of fundamental, rational price risk or mispricing caused by insane people, but it's really costly to exploit. So it can exist, but it's hard to exploit. So you get return if you can deal with it. Now, <clears throat> the biggest arbitrage cost, arguably, is the career risk arbitrage cost. Risk is risk. We all kind of understand that because you learn that in uh, you know, Economics 101. And, and there is arbitrage cost of you know, shorting, you know, the frictional cost of trading, blah, blah, blah. But this is probably the biggest one. So this is a summary of a chart of an idea from a paper, uh, Limits Arbitrage, by uh, Schleifer and Bichini. It's a 1997 Journal of Finance paper that everyone should read. But, or I can just look at this chart, because I'm going to be this summary. Um, the x-axis here. This is now, t equals zero. This is the short term, t equals one. This is the long term, whatever that means to you, t equals two. The y-axis here is this, this fake stuff <coughs> where it's currently here, but you're God, let's say, and you know with certainty that in the long term, it's worth that. Okay, so the Friedman hypothesis, which you talked about a long time ago, is this can't exist because God, who's sitting here saying, oh my God, this thing's undervalued, I'm just going to keep buying until it's like one penny marginally below undervalued, and these prices will move in line, and the market's efficient, right? But that's not reality. The reality is, you sit here and you're like, okay, there's two states of the world. 
Market can get rational because people realize how smart I am and the fundamental value that you know discount cash flows of all the you know future dividend streams. Um, people are somehow going to magically realize this and I'll be make money. Or people think I'm insane and in the short run this thing gets more and more undervalued, beat up, and I got to go to my investors here. And you tell your investors, you're like, investors, I am God. I am the smartest person on planet Earth. I know everything. I'm down 50%, but just trust me. It's going to 200. You just got to stick with me, baby. Um, and of course, going up this path would be a genius, and you know, you charge 220, and it's all good. Um, but when you sit right here, anyone who's been in the real market knows that prices don't just magically go to the fundamental value that you believe in. They can go that way, or they go the opposite way. But if you do this trade, you're going to get fired, right? To the extent that you don't have capital that is very, very savvy, very, very disciplined, and very, very programmed to understand and acknowledge this risk right here, they're going to rely on short-term performance, right? And that makes sense. If, you, if there's a lot of volatility, a lot of variability, a lot of, you know, opaqueness, when you're down 50%, you stop believing what the master of the universe told you. You start believing that you're down 50% and this guy's an idiot. Fire, right? So this is what they call career risk. And the problem with this is it creates like a principal agent issue where let's say I run an asset management business. I love managing $100 billion at 1%, right? I don't like managing $100 at 1%. So I sit back here and I'm like, all right, I got hundred million dollars and it's kind of sticky, it's kind of stuck because I already did my pitch, all these people. If I underperform in a huge way, that might get their spidey sense going and they'll rip all my capital out. But as long as I kind of hold the kitty, you know, keep the ship aligned, running around with the other benchmarks out there, there's a high probability that I'm going to lose all this money. And so even though the optimal decision for me as presumably a value enhancing active manager trying to you know, beat the market, I would just go all in on this thing and tell my clients like, hey, suck it up and shut up. We're gonna do this. But you're not gonna do that. You're gonna just kind of closet index, right? Because that makes sense from a business standpoint. So this is a major conflict of interest in some sense. It's just a reality of the marketplace where a lot of open secret strategies, especially those associated with mispricing elements, this causes a massive cost because people like the jobs. Go figure, right? Everyone loves their job. But to the extent this sort of element is embedded in a trade like momentum, it's really hard for people to exploit this as a business, frankly. Um, so, to quantify that, what I actually did is we actually create the God portfolio, which, and this is something that I don't, I can't take credit <coughs> for this. I was at one of these mutual admiration society deals in Nantucket, and this guy who's actually an old Chicago PhD that's pretty famous, he's drunk and he walks up to me, he told me to t do this test. And what this test is, so I don't want to take credit for this idea, I think this is some old rich guy gave it to me, but he's like, here's what I want you to do. You go back in the data, and you stand right here, and you have perfect foresight. You're like Biff from the uh, Back to the Future, right? You know everything, because you got to go in time and come back. And you can sort stocks in 1927 on their five-year performance, right? Because you got a computer, and we already know what happened. And what we can do is we can create decile portfolios where we'll create the God portfolio, where we get a look and cheat, where we know what maximized the returns in five years, but we're gonna own that today, right? And we're gonna keep doing that for the last, whatever, 100 years almost. And of course, the decile charts are the prettiest decile charts you've ever seen in your life, right? Because obviously, the known losers after five years have a we're like 15% compounded annual growth rate. If you do negative 15% for that many years, you end up with zero, basically. You don't really get to zero, but you pretty, get pretty damn close, right? And then of course, it, with perfect foresight, it's the most monotonic, like perfect linear relationship of all time because we're God, 
And God here earns almost 30% Kagers for like 100 years. And I told the last group, we actually did a study because you can say, hey, what's the total market value in 1927? We know the, the market value of the whole thing now. If you were to compound at 30% Kagers for that whole time period, you end up owning literally half the market, right? Because if you compound a million dollars times 30% for 100, you have like $10 trillion, right? So this isn't even obviously realistic, but it just is what it is. This is, this is the perfect portfolio with the maximum mispricing you could possibly achieve. Incredible. But <laughs> let's look at the drawdowns on this God portfolio and the S&P. And it's, it's remarkable. Like this was the most surprising thing ever. Like the drawdowns are basically the same. He, he recoups way faster, right? So, which is good, but he still loses like in the Great Depression, you know, 75% where S&P is like whatever, 85, right? So the main point is risk just cannot be destroyed. Even with perfect foresight, if you own beta, or you own any equity risk, even if you know exactly who the winners are, this risk just cannot be destroyed. It's just a fact, and, it, and it's remarkable, and it, it just highlights over and over again that to the extent that someone is pitching you something that says, hey, I'm so smart, I make a lot of returns and no risk, you know, because we know these sort of facts, I'm like, that's impossible. Like even, I know with perfect foresight, the best trader on the, on the planet, and I know he gets his face ripped off sometimes. So you're telling me you're smarter than God, right? It just can't be the case. So if I'm thinking about a strategy, and I'm thinking about out of sample equilibrium performance that you know, should work in dynamic economy, I need to know what's the risk. Because there's probably some risk if it's going to have some return, right? It's just the fact. Maybe it's just beta. You own equities. That's, that's, that's a fundamental risk that will earn a return over time. And then there's an the element, okay, you think there's mispricing. There probably is. I can agree. I can buy that argument. But that mispricing, you now got to tell me why Millennia or like Sig or all the, like the 200 IQ guys are already doing it. Because if it's, if it's something that the really smart people can do, it's gone. It's a fleeting trade, and it's the, it's the dynamic game of trading. It's basically liquidity provision, if you ask me. But we don't want to be, if we're investors, we want to find mispricing that doesn't end up basically in liquidity provision to the traders. It's you're exploiting systematic problems in the market, but it's hard to do because it doesn't like correct every day. It corrects in like 10 years potential, right? You got to stick with it. Um, so, to summarize, what is momentum that I'm talking about here? Buying winners, relative strength winners. Um, do transactions costs destroy these things? Not really. They're definitely capacity constrained. If someone tells you you can do a trillion dollars in momentum, you know, you probably tell them to get out of your house because um, they're lying. Um, is it too crowded? Like, because all these ETFs, everyone's a momentum factor. Like, there's like 20 of them. Every firm in Wall Street has one. But it doesn't seem like it. One, they're not really trading momentum factor. And then two, in aggregate, even if they were, there's probably some, appreciate that. There's probably some on the other side in a sector fund that's kind of accidentally being anti-momentum. So there's, there seems to be like a dynamic supply-demand where arguably that could also increase the capacity. And then the, the final thing is, well, how can someone so dumb, like just sorting stocks on the past 12 month returns or buying cheap stocks on PE ratios, how can that work when everyone knows about it? Well, it's because those things tend to be proxies for a real risk factor and a costly arbitrage. So they're a proxy for some systematic behavioral error that's really hard to actually exploit. It's like shorting Tesla. It's, we all know, it might be a good idea, but it's not really a good idea, because you'll die. So anyways, <laughs> any questions? Getting cotton out there, I gotta drink some water. Yes, sir. Uh, have you identified, great, amazing presentation. Um, have you identified a, a macro environment where momentum works best uh, or worst? Mm. Uh, well, I can identify anything with a computer, but the question is, can I identify 
robustly with high prediction where I know out of sample it's worth me like shifting and being dynamic? No. Like in general, that I mean I'm I'm kind of more in like the asness, like anti trying to factor time camp. Um, you know, because you can do it and you can torture data and you can build amazing factor timing things. But then in the end, if you try it out a sample or tweak it a little bit, it, it's just it's really difficult. Um, and, and in particular with like like factors and like you know, if you let's say you're a valuable man, a person like we are, like I always tell people, listen, value's got its own religion, momentum's got its own religion, and they're structurally different. That's why they yin and yang with each other. And that's a known bird in the bush, right? So you could just hold both of them and get the known diversification benefit. It's pretty valuable. Or you could start dicking with it and say, well, it's shift our momentum because of this macro regime or whatever whiz-bang model you got. We're going to shift the momentum, shift the value or whatever. The problem is that's fine, and you can back test it and show that it might work. But now you're structurally giving up the awesome bird in the bush you had, which is just combining the two things, right? So it's one of these things where, where I'm kind of moving a fork shape, probably because I'm getting too old now, I'm not even that old, where I, I started to become like artsy on quant, which is weird, where, where I, even though I can back test it, and on paper, like, okay, it looks like you've shipped me value momentum, you get like an extra point on your cagers or whatever, but yeah, I just think, well, I'm giving up the structural, probably out of sample, like economically driven, you know, cooling benefit. And that, that's worth a lot to me, in, in, and I can't really prove it per se with the data, because you could data mine out and say, well, it should be a factor timer, but it just, it's one of those things where just going back to first principles, I lean towards simple and kind of crappy, but robust versus complex, high chance optimization, you know, whiz banging yourself to death. Um, so, I don't know, long answer to say yes, you can, <laughs> but I'm not going to believe it, probably. Um, I could, I'm always open to it, but I, no one's ever shown me you can do it uh, robustly <coughs> and simply, too. Um, yes, sir. All the, the data that you showed, does that assume yeah. a long only portfolio? Mm -hmm. And have you looked at kind of like what those drawdowns look like if you shorted the bottom decile? Yeah. So, what's great, we have a, this post, it, it's like we do it. Uh, Kind of make fun of hedge fund managers or whatever. Um, <laughs> right, like the long short God's portfolio where you really whoop it on, right? On that one, I don't show it here because it's just it's simpler, but if you do the long short, the God portfolio is like 50 kicker. But when you look on this thing, even though you know the winners, you know the losers, you still you don't get these crazy drawdowns because you ripped out the beta risk. But you still get a whole bunch of like 20, 25 drawdowns on it, which is crazy because you know the winners, you know the losers. But just back to like the that Cypher Vishni chart right here, like this, this is just a fact. You know, markets can get crazier before they get smarter. It just it's in the data, it's baked in the cake. And that was actually Schiller's original argument where he's like, okay. So we got all these dividends, we kind of know their variability, and prices are supposed to reflect like the discounted cash flow of all the future dividends back to the day. And we kind of know their deviation. But if we look at stock prices and how much they deviate, it, there's no way in heck that they could be fundamentally priced if they're supposed to be priced on this dividend stream because they move so much more than could ever be economically justified. It's got to be just the animal spirits out there. Um, I mean, you see that in the, in the God long short, like the perfect trader still will look like an idiot sometimes, um, which is just unfortunate. Uh, it'd be nice if you were just Bernie Madoff turns all day, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't seem to work like that. Uh, until you get the Yeah, until, until, until you get the 100% drawdown. Uh, I've seen a lot of those strategies. Um, Yes, sir. It, so it's very easy if you want to just get a sense of what worked and what hasn't. Um, mm -hmm. It's very easy to use like the iShares ETFs, but as you pointed out, it's not a real good read on momentum, right? Versus yeah. Have the, you seen any sort of benchmarks that are a good read? Yeah. On? So what what I would do is um, just go to like French's website. Ken French has a data mm -hmm. portal. Well, yeah. he'll really give you the decile sorts 
on the, the 212 momentum portfolio. It, like, so you, you just go get those monthly returns. He also does it by size, so if you want to control for like size elements. If you want to see kind of what the academic momentum factor is actually doing, just go to his website and you could download it and put that chart and then overlay it on like MTUM. Yeah. And and you'll see that that like clearly MTUM is not resembling like momentum portfolios in any traditional sense. Um, but that's fine. That there, I mean, it's whooping ass. So it's making a lot of money. But if your if your idea is you're being sold on buying the momentum factor i.e. the one that's in this academic research, that would arguably not be true. Um, but hey, who cares? It, like, you know, I'm sure client's pretty happy with MTUM, right? <laughs> who cares what it's called? It's making a lot of money. Um, but, but again, the problem with that is when, it, when MTUM starts blowing up, if people don't really understand how and what they're buying and why, it, you know, it's gonna go the opposite way. They're all gonna like blow out of the thing too. So, you know, there's always trade-offs. Sorry, I got to get out of here. Yeah. Um.